Hello and welcome to the Culture Quarter. I'm Siobhan Heenew. Coming up, the stunning images that wowed judges at the National Photographic Portrait Prize. Plus, the War Memorial scores a major win in its battle for government funds. But first, the National Museum of Australia is holding a major exhibition looking at the history of the Irish in Australia, from the First Fleet all the way to the current influx of Irish backpackers. Here's a behind-the-scenes look at what it takes to bring such a big show together. We followed conservators and curators as they prepared precious and priceless objects. This magnificent iron anchor tells the story of fragility. It comes from a ship that brought 180 young single Irish girls to Australia in search of work as domestic servants and dairy maids in the 19th century. The ship was wrecked just off the Australian coast, but miraculously, all on board survived. Lovely stories about the the young women, Irish women, there's about 175 of them on the ship, being carried on the backs of the sailors and saying Hail Marys as they're carried through the the waves. Uh, But I see this anchor as, as representing thousands and thousands of assisted migrants who came from Ireland. A two-ton challenge for curators, it's been transported from a caravan park in South Australia all the way to Canberra for conservation and installation. From politics and religion to industry and art, the Irish have had a significant influence on Australian life since 1788. We have got an object from the First Fleet and we have an object, a backpack, from a, a lady who arrived in Australia in 2005. A few weeks out from the show's opening, the items are coming in from all over the country. The most stunning arrival, the suits of armour worn by the Kelly Gang, all four of them. They will make an awesome sight in the gallery, there there is no doubt about that. It does take you back a little bit to what Ned must have looked like as he appeared in in the morning mist coming out of the trees and shooting at the the police. They saw him as a, a frightening sight. Uh, Is it frightening? Possibly it is. I mean, it's taking us back to one of the most violent clashes within Australian history, and we must never forget that. Before putting them on display, conservators used this rare access to conduct some rather groundbreaking research on the Kelly garb. We were particularly interested in what temperature the armour had been heated to because there was a lot of debate in the community about whether it was done in a forge, which would get to a very high temperature, or in a fire in the bush, which would get to a low temperature. Um, We did this analysis on this suit of armour in collaboration with ANSTO and also the University of Canberra, and we found out that actually it had been heated to quite a low temperature, which meant that... A lot of hard work had to go into making the armour. There was a lot of bashing and and, and physical um, effort required. 130 years after the siege of Glen Rowan, these near-mythical outfits are still offering up their secrets to the inquisitive. Some objects in museum contexts are more powerful than others, and there's absolutely no doubt that the Kelly armour is incredibly compelling. Uh, you know, it's kind of physically powerful and, uh, yes, all the marks of its history are there, uh, very visible, uh, and so they tell a story in a very powerful way. Like the Kelly armour, many of these objects represent the interwoven histories of two nations, none more so than this jaunting car from Donegal, owned by a Kinglake man whose house was razed by the Victorian bushfires. In the shed next door, his sacred heirloom was singed but survived the fires that devastated so much. There are some very unusual ancient objects too. Tell us about this magnificent piece that we have here and what's its significance in Irish-Australian history? Well, these are the antlers of an extinct great elk, giant elk. Uh, These are called the Irish elk, although apparently the, the Irish elk was found all the way from Ireland to central Russia, so it's not just an Irish thing. But uh, a number of them were sort of being found in Ireland in the 19th century, and uh, uh, aristocrats who had the money for this kind of thing uh, were getting them, fra- uh, not framed, but getting them put up in, uh, in, their, um, in their homes. An extraordinary object, and one that a lot of work has gone on to get it ready for display. 
Shipped out by a wealthy Irish settler as a reminder of home, they're among the most delicate items going on show. Over in the textile lab, energy is high and the pace is rapid, with last-minute repairs to garments that represent the power and the passion of a culture. You can't have an exhibition about the Irish in Australia without looking at the role of the Catholic Church. And, of course, an outfit like this uh, is, is what many people would, uh, would identify with, with that church and its role in Australia. The Irish nuns, being taught by Irish nuns, Sisters of Mercy and so on. Although the particular habit here is actually one that they wore in tropical areas. This is a belong to the Sisters of St John of God way up in the Broome region, right up in the northwest. And they actually came out in their black habits there's the story about them wading ashore in those habits at Beagle Bay. And then later on, another Irish priest came about 1916 to Broome and said, you can't keep wearing those heavy surge habits. You know, they were absolutely, God, goodness knows what it was like. So he suggested lighter material and brought some up from Perth. And eventually they got into, what was they called it, the white habit, or the tropical habit. Or whatever. But you're right about the church. I mean, the, the Catholic church in, in Australia at one stage was virtually an Irish church in terms of the bishops and the priests and the nuns who uh, staffed it. There was, there's, there's no doubt about that. So, yes, you, you can't do an exhibition about the Irish in Australia without at least looking at that role and that uh, those stories. And there's some fantastic stories. Then there's this resplendent wall of ceremonial trowels that have turned sod at churches and convents across the continent. Rich silks belonging to those who wielded great power sit alongside tattered remnants of the immigrant journey. And they're all sacred in their own way. The possibilities of childhood and elegance in ageing. They're two of the themes that come through in the entries for this year's National Photographic Portrait Prize. For the first time, a woman has won the prize with a striking image that pays homage to the more painterly traditions of portraiture. From the very young to the very old, the famous to the anonymous, they're all here, images that portray the ever-changing face of Australia. The National Photographic Portrait Prize, run by the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra, invites both professional and amateur photographers to compete in the same competition. The diversity of artists is exceeded only by the diversity of subjects. There are artful happy snaps of friends and family, stylised, spectacular self-portraits and stunning glimpses into the emotional otherworld of the human face. This year, there's an unusually high representation of children's faces. Including a photograph of a baby immediately after birth, which is a very interesting shot. The most uh, dramatic and uh, powerful evocation of coming into life that I've ever seen. And for the first time, the prize has gone to a woman for this striking portrait of a woman she befriended and first photographed 25 years ago. She's got a strong face and it's expressive. It's an unusual face, but also she's got a strong and expressive spirit. What is so compelling about this photograph is the combination of the haughty, proud demeanour of the sitter uh, and uh, a look of vulnerability or wariness in her beautiful brown eyes. The winning image was chosen from 1,200 entries and the $25,000 prize money will be put to good use. Probably means I'll get a new camera. Many of the images take inspiration from the historic conventions of portrait painting. There are Rembrandt-like compositions and Florentine faces. There's the heartwarming along with the heart-wrenching. And then there's even a portrait with no face at all. A modern take on a modern world. It's one of Australia's busiest tourist attractions. But like the other public cultural institutions, the Australian War Memorial has been struggling financially. It's recently won a reprieve, with the government promising an extra $8 million per year. Anna Morozo has the story. There we are. Julia Gillard is putting her money where her mouth is. I became concerned that we were not funding the war memorial in a way which was sustainable over time. For years, government efficiency dividends have been putting the squeeze on the memorial's budget. Last year, it lost seven jobs. But in the wake of a review of the institution's funding arrangements, the future is looking rosier. I can today announce we will make available an additional $8 million each year for the war memorial. It means that 
a lot of the activities we'd restricted can be reinstated. It completely takes away the possibility of losing 20 staff positions in the next budget. So it's great news. The announcement comes as the War Memorial prepares for the centenary of the 1915 Anzac landings. A special ministerial portfolio has been created to oversee the anniversary. To coincide, the galleries that tell the story of the First World War will be revamped, with the help of a one-off $1.7 million grant. Those who've been calling for the boost say it's an important investment. The War Memorial's function is both a memorial and a museum, and in part of that museum is to inform the Australian public of what we'd on, and from that we hope to learn the lessons of war. While the War Memorial can now breathe a sigh of relief, the capital's other cultural institutions are wondering when their reprieve will come. The National Museum is calling for voluntary redundancies, and the National Library is also shedding staff. I would hope that the government would give a similar consideration to uh, the needs of the other cultural institutions. The National Museum has been suffering a decline in funding since it was established a decade ago. Its 10th birthday went barely unnoticed, with no spare cash for celebrations. The cultural institutions have, you know, had it tough. But even in a harsh financial environment, the museum's new director is dedicated to improving one of the capital's more maligned cultural institutions. The risk of doing nothing is simply to see a, a, an organisation um, uh, you know, decline and, uh, and cease to have any vitality. In light of the War Memorial's new cash handout, the other institutions are saying, what about us? I think the directors of cultural institutions have been making the point, you know, for some years that at some point the, the funding issues facing us would be really drastic. And I think that's the point we've now reached. But at the moment, their calls for help are yet to be answered. And that's all for this episode. I'm Siobhan Henew and I'll catch you next time on The Culture Quarter. Culture Quarter.